is that for every table to discuss both of these key questions here, uh, do you number one, do you believe that the Irish government should follow the UK government decision in mandating the use of BIM on public sector projects? And we could have a minimum of three reasons for and against. And then to follow with how best can the Irish construction industry lobby or influence the decision and the direction of the Irish government in regard to BIM. So if each table could address both of those for the next uh, 10 stroke 15 minutes, and then if we could also nominate a spokesperson from each table, and what we'll do is we'll very quickly go around the room just to get feedback from the floor. Can I ask just here in front of me, table one, could um, we get some feedback from table one, please? Just introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Michael Early from Scott Town Walker Architects. Um, uh, I'll do it quickly. Just on uh, question one, do we believe the Irish government should follow the UK government decision in mandating the use of BIM on public sector projects? So three reasons for and against. Uh, the reasons for uh, would be on uh, for cost reductions, uh, waste reduction. Uh, ultimately, you get a better building um, because you'd have a lot more data about the building, and uh, we believe the uh, carbon reduction is a, is a, is a big issue, uh, especially heading towards 2020, and uh, it'll extend uh, the life cycle of the the building. Um, the reasons against would be. Um, uh, the main first reason we, we thought was uh, that the government shouldn't ask until they know what they're asking for. Um, they, we have a potential, potentially for an uneducated uh, client, um, which could then in turn add more cost uh, uh, to everyone uh, by having more red tape. Uh, there's a potential for duplication of effort uh, with the UK as well, um, that we're doing the same thing that they're doing. Um, so we'd need to look at, at that. Uh, question two, uh, how can we best uh, the Irish construction industry influence um, the Irish government? Um, thoughts were that the Construction Industry Council uh, would be out there maybe as one voice. Uh, one voice would be seen as being important rather than a, a number of voices coming to the, uh, to the government. Um, and potentially as well that maybe the government have one department responsible for BIM, either an existing department that's there, maybe possibly the Department of Finance was uh, cited, uh, but possibly maybe that there would be one person as well, similar to the, the chief scientific advisor. Uh, you'd have a chief construction advisor, which would not be too unlike uh, Paul Morrell in the UK, that would be responsible for delivering. Okay. Catherine, can I give it to you? Thanks. Uh, Catherine Megan from the Institute of Architects. Um, in relation to question one, uh, we came up with the three uh, reasons we would see for um, the government mandating it are primarily competitiveness for the industry. Um, the second reason would be in relation to driving change uh, from a top-down approach that if the government are mandating it, industry will follow. Um, and the third reason is, is uh, really is, is more of a driver for the change is for the government to identify pilot projects. There are some suggestions that possibly the Department of Education uh, current program. We haven't actually come up with any reasons against it, but we do realise there are certain obstacles in relation to the current work practices within the construction industry and also the uh, costs for um, private industry at the moment uh, in implementing uh, BIM into their um, companies. In relation to question two, uh, the exact same uh, reasons as uh, table one came up with, CIC should be used as, as the lobbying um, uh, organization and also identify the need to identify a single point of contact within government uh, so that exactly the same as table one. Thank you. Great, very good. We'll move now to table three. Pass it over. Uh, Joe Miller from the RIAI. Uh, we, we made a policy decision. We, we decided not to answer question one because we knew everybody else in the room would. 
Uh, we, we, we talked around, I'd say, question two. And our feeling is that <clears throat> the client, as a procurer, needs to be educated. Uh, the client, as a procurer, needs to see the full life cycle of the building and the requirement for uh, life cycle costings would be integrated into the brief. Um, we suspect that life cycle costings would be uh, a, a major element in uh, brief design. We talked about um, the end game, which David men mentioned earlier on. The client really needs to look, st to start with the end game. In, in asking the question in terms of procurement. Uh, we talked about education of the public client, and if you consider the, the procurement process, just in, for example, schools at the moment, where it is influenced heavily by the Department of Education and Skills, but through development, ends up with boards of management making decisions, which again, could affect both the procurement process and the lifetime cycle of the building. We talked about the user, the end user, being involved in the briefing and decision making, which we feel is not, not something that's thought of very much uh, at the moment. And we talked about research and building studies, which have been carried out in the United States and hopefully are starting here, uh, in terms of the whole lifestyle, uh, life cycle uh, of the building, in terms of, again, procurement and briefing. Did I miss anything? No, very much, yes. Joe, could I ask you to pass it over to Table 6? Table 6 here. I'm Maliki Matthews, BIM leader in the Dublin Institute of Technology. Uh, we have a good cross-section of industry, both uh, in uh, design and construction and uh, uh, suppliers here as well. Um, general agreement, yes, that uh, the Irish government should follow the UK government decision. Um, Without a doubt, uh, we see advantages in job creation, in uh, competitiveness in our, in, in our business, and a, an opportunity for uh, reinvestment uh, in, into our business. Um, how best can we uh, lobby? Um, well, without doubt, through the professional organisations, uh, the CIF, the RAI, IE, everybody else. Um, if it's coming from a solid base of these uh, um, uh, professional organisations, um, uh, the government will and should uh, sit up and take notice. But um, uh, following the UK, um, if we are a certain amount of years behind the UK in regards to where we are on this now, isn't it fantastic that the UK uh, have done an awful lot of the groundwork on it? And certainly, um, this is about uh, saving, it's about being more efficient in our business. Uh, and over the last 10 years, uh, we were so busy uh, making money, as we thought, that uh, we didn't have time to actually sit back and reflect. Certainly this time that we're in now gives us plenty of opportunity to sit back and reflect and look at how we did our business and uh, uh, project over the next decade as to how we are going to go about doing our business. And without doubt, uh, BIM, uh, technologies and applications, methodologies uh, is the future there. Uh, John Purcell, Farming, uh, Table 5. And like the other tables, we have a mix of, of, of uh, quite a good mix between contractors and designers and, and uh, suppliers. And uh, So we just very briefly, and maybe to, to, to bring a slightly different aspect to it, I mean, we did discuss most of the s mostly similar topics, but one of the pros we see was, was the benefit of BIM bringing a drive to make the industry more technically aware and competitive at home and, and, and overseas. We had the, the, the uh, potential savings and efficiencies both during the design construction stage and, and in operation. And the third benefit we had was the data for, for FM for the client going forward. On the con side, uh, probably not surprisingly, we, 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 had, uh, we had three which were the, the, the lack of incentive for, for industry to invest. Uh, we see a lack of government structure at this present time to, to, to drive it forward. We also saw a lack of, of suitable projects of a scale because it seems clear that BIM performs best uh, in a larger scale, but even though it can perform at all levels, 
On question two, uh, how best can, can, can we influence the, the, uh, gov the government in regard to BIM? Uh, obviously, seat in itself is, is a lobby forum, judging by, by the number of people here. And the Construction Industry Council has to be a, a, a very important forum also. Uh, Owen Burke of GT Cramptons. Uh, like previous speakers, um, three main uh, for question one, four were to achieve savings for the government to build up some form of data base going forward, which should definitely help them. And I suppose to benefit our own industry um, in trying to achieve efficiencies in an industry that's suffering greatly at the moment. From the point of view of against, um, use the UK ba as a basis because they have they've set it up. They're at an early stage, so it can be reviewed from our point of view and, and tweaked for our uh, industry. Slight downside of that would be obviously then cost and mainly a mindset change for both government and industry. With regard to question two. Um, the main, as previous speakers have noted, uh, would be a case study really to prove to the government that there are, and to, to all concerned, that there are real benefits. And the likes of healthcare and education are probably the two main, in, are two main functions that would benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Denise Germain, um, representing CIAT, uh, Chartered Institute of Architectural Technologists. Um, the table generally uh, uh, agreed that um, bringing uh, BIM into the Irish construction industry was more or less uh, uh, imperative, um, although there is the, the drawback that the government is a bit reluctant at the moment um, to ensure that smaller practices are not marginalised um, in the current climate. Um, but um, it was generally felt that if we don't progress, we'll be left out of the race against foreign practices and um, the opportunity to export our design services. Um, practices at the moment, um, due to the downturn in the industry, may have the time to upgrade and to review upgrading their, their, their systems, um, if not the resources but also the time to devote to training and upskilling. Um, on question two, um, we agreed that uh, um, lobbying by professional institutes um, of the government was the best way to go, either through the CIC or individually. Thank you. Conor Hogan, um, table nine. The, um, on the first uh, question, the four, uh, we said we should follow the uh, world trend. Uh, while we agree with the UK uh, government decision um, that the Irish government should follow it, we should not just fo follow the UK model, but the uh, best practice in the UK or the US and Australia and so forth. Uh, in other words, we should look at all countries. Uh, Secondly, the second four uh, was that uh, we should obviously train our graduates uh, so they require the knowledge because uh, given the current climate, the likelihood is that they will be uh, entering markets where BI or BIM is being used. Uh, and that the ideal time is now uh, due to the current market conditions. Uh, and uh, the third point is by mandating the um, use of BIM, you affect change and this creates knowledge for the future. There was some discussion regarding the um, who uh, retains that knowledge or who controls the knowledge. Against it, uh, there was a view expressed that it, uh, it would become anti-competitive, it would uh, militate against SMEs, particularly regarding the uh, particularly large threshold, like or five million threshold, and you could end up with a two-tier industry. Uh, the second point was there is a uh, Maybe we should just look at it, and uh, there are an awful lot of changes happening in the Irish construction industry at the moment between the various GCC contracts and regulations and so forth, and this will be another change. Uh, the third was that uh, the, 
the use of BIM uh, is, is enabled by cloud computing and there's a cost uh, of this to companies. Uh, there's a comfort or a, a discomfort, maybe is a more appropriate word, with it uh, because uh, we, there's an issue about intellectual property rights and the, uh, the, the loss of same. On the second point, how best can the Irish construction industry lobby and influence? The uh, overriding view was that CETA uh, and the various uh, uh, professional institutions should lobby uh, the GCC and the government uh, uh, to enable a, project, a pilot project which would uh, show the cost savings. Uh, we also, obviously, uh, the government or, uh, or the professional body should provide training as to where we are going in relation to the um, to be at BIM. Uh, and thirdly, that uh, the BIM should be tied in with other projects showing that uh, the energy efficiency, uh, energy efficiency and sustainability uh, and, and therefore promote its use. Hi, David O'Brien, Art Talks, um, Table 11. Um, for question one, um, the table generally agreed there was a need for efficiency in the Irish construction market. Um, uh, BIM lead, uh, lends itself towards that. There was a point made about uh, entering into the European market, being better equipped with uh, skill sets, um, gives us a better opportunity to uh, potentially enter into markets outside of Ireland. <laughs> Um, also, um, it was agreed that the fees for, the, for generally for the design team using the, the current procurement routes are quite low and BIM directly impacts this and um, those were the reasons for uh, quite a few reasons against. <coughs> uh, the current procurement routes, um, the table felt that it was difficult to see how that was going to work. Um, it's kind of, BIM does lend itself a little bit more towards design and build rather than design and then build. Um, currently there's no contractor involvement early on in the, per in the current procurement routes and that was a, an issue here. Uh, also there was an issue from the education point of view that if um, students in colleges etc were learning uh, the, the software rather than the actual um, knowledge of it being how to be able to build buildings and how to design buildings properly. Uh, for question two, um, there was uh, a comment about, uh, about the incentive from government uh, similar to table five and uh, that really um, what government could do is, is uh, maybe offer a tax incentive or some sort of grant that would um, allow the easier uh, adoption of BIM in Ireland. <laughs> yeah, sure, it's uh, Brian Lauf here from Thomas Garden and Partners. We had a very similar thought to the rest of the room. Um, on the, the kind of fur mandating side, we, we, we saw the benefit for the costs and wastes and savings, um, and also that it fits in with the ethos of the Department of Finance contracts. Um, the reason for not mandating really would be the impact it would have in the industry, particularly SMEs. And that instead of mandating that maybe promoting should be the way to go, the government should go with regard to um, providing grants for hardware, software and upskilling, um, providing billing regulation checks automatically and, and making BIM libraries available. Um, on the second question, um, we felt the best way the industry could, could influence the government would really be by, by proving the stats and the savings that, are, that can be gained, probably through pilot programs, maybe through schools, and also to show the export value that BIM may have for the service um, overseas. Uh, uh, Jared Burke, Office of Public Works. The general view around the table was that while BIM is a good thing, um, we focused on why mandating it might be a good thing. Um, the overview, the best, the benefits from mandating we thought would be the general upskilling of the Irish workforce in making it more uh, competitive abroad and that perhaps professional fees would be reduced, therefore saving to the public purse. Um, against it, the, there was a lot of concern that by making it mandatory it does discriminate against SMEs 
uh, particularly in the current economic climate. And also there's a feeling that it doesn't, BIM doesn't fit very well with the government procurement as it as stands at the moment and the highly um, adversarial, adversarial approach of uh, public contracts uh, doesn't fit with the BIM collaboration uh, attitude. We thought it, if vendors could reduce um, the costs, that would be um, a good reason. In, in, in parallel with government mandating, that would be good. Or if it fitted in with an overall government strategy to uh, reduce savings, if there was a clear plan for that. Focusing on why we should follow the UK government's decision, it did strike us that the UK government must have spent a lot of money getting their BIM project to where it is today. And we could piggyback on that here and we could start ahead of, the, of, of that and use their research for the Irish government to develop uh, a BIM strategy. How best to introduce it um, or influence it? We thought that the most important thing is that um, the Irish construction industry needs to formulate a convincing case uh, and then go out and promote that case. As, as, as things stand, we don't think a very strong case has been made or an easily digestible case. That was this table's uh, position. Uh, Angus O'Keefe from Ronan and Donovan Consulting Engineers. Um, as briefly as possible, the opinion at the table was generally yes, but it was a tentative yes and in a couple of cases no. Um, there was a feeling that if the Irish construction industry isn't up to speed with, with building information modelling over the next few years, that when the uh, market does pick up, that we could really be hit badly by um, the introduction of, of uh, foreign services into the country who will be able to undercut all the, the, the local services. Um, uh, we, we felt, obviously, like a lot of other tables, that there, there needs to be a review of case studies, but not necessarily on individual projects from around the world, but on, on national projects and how it's managed to improve the situation for the clients. And also then that the, the, the current quieter time in the market does present an opportunity for change. Um, from, from the point of view of best uh, influencing the, the government to, to bring on this change, um, it's, it's, you know, we could all lobby and, and, and have case studies within the Irish market, but I think, or not I, but, but there, were, there were opinions at the table as well that we need to uh, lobby the government to hire a chief construction advisor. As to who that could be, uh, we didn't come up with a name, um, but really that seems to have been quite a significant driver in the UK and, 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 and could hopefully be used here, uh, someone that the government trusts. Hi, Pat Slattery 12, yeah, obviously as last table I think most of the points have already been covered. Um, we had an interesting discussion, we probably didn't really address the points um, that much, but there was a general feeling that the government, um, as the only large client body, are the only ones who can, Im who can sort of I influence the implementation of BIM. There were concerns over the cost of implementation and how that would be met when project costs are being driven down, um, both from fees and construction cost side of things. And so long as project procurement is uh, based on the construction cost and not the whole sort of life cycle cost of the building, then uh, there isn't really an incentive for people to push towards BIM. Um, there's a mix of sort of engineers and services and uh, other people around the table here. Um, some who are already using BIM and they felt that there was sort of an, org an organic um, adoption of BIM happening anyway. Um, so, I mean, following the UK policy may not necessarily be the best thing, but obviously, yes, it, sh it should be. Um, and I think there was a thought that there's a requirement for an intelligent client and maybe intelligent clients and the Irish government at the moment don't necessarily go hand in hand. <laughs> <laughs> First off, I, mean, I thought that the discussion today has been fantastic. I mean, it's been especially erudite. I think, in terms of 
the key thing that's came through for me in terms of the conversation has not been about BIM, but for the opportunity for change. And I think in terms of the government construction strategy in the UK, that's what it's about in terms of doing BIM. It's about the need for industry reform and the opportunity that brings. And I think the other key theme that's came out is, you know, that the cost of not doing this, you know, what happens if you don't do this in Ireland? Well, you'll end up importing the skills from elsewhere. And I think at this moment in time, where you sit there is a real opportunity as many folk have said, to learn from others what the UK is doing, from Australia, from the US. You can be quick and agile. You have got a massive opportunity to change tact and to really speed up the process. I think what I do see is certainly the theme is, you know, as Andrew yeah. said, you know, you're certainly co-destiny in terms of where you want to, to want to go. The key things that, that I heard as well, it sounds as if you need to build, if you like, a case study for Ireland as well of, of what this actually looks like. You know, look to see where is the tangible value proposition. Obviously, cost seems to be an issue. Well, I'll also look in terms of cost, but what is that return on investments? You know, we've got some good case studies out there now that you can draw upon as well. And I think one of the things that you know, used to keep me up at night as well, and I've heard it, is do we create a two-tier construction system where you've got the tier ones that, you know, that get it, we've got the programme in place that can offer the efficiency. What about the SMEs? What about localism? And I completely agree that is a barrier. It's one of our key things in the UK that we're trying to address as well. But uh, it's like everything, I think it will be Darwinian. You know, industry will change, it's a bit like, you know, the internet and the email. You know, BIM's not going to go away, it's going to happen. <coughs> and I think what we've seen in the UK is, you know, BIM doesn't sit in the woods waiting for you to come along and jump on top of you and be your friend. You've got to go out, you've got to start driving change, you know, and hopefully, I really think in terms of CETA, I think this is going to be really, you know, the start of the journey for many people in the rooms. But uh, I think also in terms of who takes your conversation forward, well, obviously, it sounded very as if it's institutionally led and I know in the UK we've been fortunate the likes of our construction industry council and the institutions you know to have a really good joined up conversation and I think getting them together in the same room is a fantastic way forward but uh, obviously all the things I'd like to do is you know wish you luck in terms of where BIM goes and I hope in terms of the UK in terms of outreach this will be the start of the conversation we mentioned our BIM hub and you know we hope that uh, Dublin and CETA becomes, you know, very much part of our journey as well, and we certainly hope to become co-destiny partners. So, hopefully, you've, you know, today's probably you'll go away with many more questions as there is answers. But uh, hope over the next nine parts of the programme that you know you'll start to build your own thoughts and programme of where this goes. So, thank you all for coming along this morning, and I'll let Andrew close off. Thank you. Thank you, David.